Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to my show. My name is Jason DaCosta, and this is Consistent Preterism. Thank you for joining me today. Today, we're going to step away from the series 100 Reasons just for a moment, and I wanted to talk about something that uh, came up in discussion with another IOer. Um, and this goes to show that we are ever changing and ever evolving and ever um, adding on to the view, and we don't stay in a position if something else works better. We surely consider uh, differing opinions, but we always go where the text and the evidence leads. Um, and I think that's the beauty of AIO and why it's so uh, powerful against a lot of these arguments is because it really does honor uh, the textual evidence and you know context and things like that. Um, so the passage is Matthew chapter 10. We all know the one where Jesus says, um, do not go here, here, and here, but rather go only to the children of Israel uh, or to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And so I had originally done a long uh, explanation of this video probably two or three years ago when I first did the channel. Um, and so I may see it slightly differently now. Uh, and let me just make sure that everybody understands this before we get into this. The storyline doesn't change one bit, okay? Whether or not my old position on Matthew 10 was correct or my newer leanings and uh, persuasions on Matthew 10 uh, is true, it doesn't matter. The story is still about the salvation of all Israel, okay? And it's still about the 12 tribes being gathered out from every nation, tribe, tongue, and kindred. It's still about an elect predestined people who would have the marking of the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's still about the ones who were under the law and needed salvation from the system of condemnation and wrath. And so there's still, it doesn't make a difference, okay? I just want to get that out there, all right? But Rob Shannon is a buddy of mine, and I think he lives in like bum hickory, Georgia. And um, he's a real redneck, a real good old boy. But he and I have uh, formed sort of a friendship, an odd friendship, um, through uh, a social media app. Um, and of course, he's, uh, he's a listener to the AIO viewpoint and a, and a proponent as well. Um, but good guy. And we oftentimes throw stuff at each other. A lot of times he'll throw stuff at me um, to get, get my thoughts on certain things and, uh, and he'll bust my balls about certain things, which is always fun, right? You need those people in your life. And so anyways... Rob brought up a good point. He said Matthew chapter 10 uh, is actually about just the uh, the towns of Israel, right? Um, and it's, it's basically the beginning of the mission and it ties in nicely with the, to the Jew first and then to the Greek or to the Jew first, then to the Gentile. So we know first and foremost that the mission was going to go to the Jew first and then to the Gentiles. In other words, to the Jews in and around Israel, the nation, and then it would venture out to the nations, right, outside of Israel. Jesus said that this gospel of the kingdom would go to all nations, and then the end would come. So Jesus shows the totality of the mission um, as he's giving his Olivet Discourse and saying that it would go to all the nations, and then the end would come, the same end that he encapsulates in that generation. So we have to recognize, first and foremost, that Jesus gives the totality of the mission away and says it would go to all nations. Likewise, in places like the parable of the prodigal son, we see that Jesus suggests that there was a son who left for the nations, who was unclean, and who would at some point come back to the father. And the father would forgive him and accept him and everything. And so we have this parable listed and, and, and uh, spoken of by Jesus during his ministry as well. We also have things like Jesus saying that he has sheep not of this fold, not of the Jewish fold, right? The different folds. We, you see that language and imagery in the Old Testament a lot that Israel was uh, Judah and Israel were the two houses and they were pictured as sheep and flocks and they would be brought back together as one flock, it says. And so here we have Jesus pulling from that Old Testament clear imagery and saying that he has sheep not of this fold and they too will come. So he's clearly speaking to Jews and telling them that he has sheep not of their fold, not of the Jewish fold, 
aka of the Gentile fold, and they too would come. But they were still sheep, okay? They were still descendants of Abraham. Um, and so we have all these things. We see the Jews, when Jesus goes up to them and talks to them, they ask themselves, you know, where does he intend to go that we cannot come? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach them? So here we have, again, another picture, uh, cl clear picture of the two parties, right? The Jews knew the dispersion was among the Greeks and they couldn't go to them, right? Because of the enmity. There was a lot of enmity there over the law. And so uh, we see that they knew very well that the dispersion was among the, the nations, right? And so these were the sheep not of this fold that Jesus spoke of. And obviously we can see they're two different parties, two different groups, and they're always pictured that way in the story. They were being brought back together as one, okay? And so we have all the information needed. Sorry, I got a, a call there. That's probably going to break up. Hopefully it doesn't come through again. Um, but we have all the information and the New Testament gospel ministry proof from Jesus in the very beginning of this tale that the uh, sheep in the nations was, were clearly in view in his overview of the gospel. In other words, what it was for. It was for all 12 tribes. That's very apparent. And uh, likewise, here in Matthew chapter 10, we see Jesus in the beginning of the gospel. Well, let me backtrack. Okay, let me backtrack. What we need to really put a focus on here is the fact that this gospel mission was going to go to the Jew first and then to the nations, right? We see that throughout the New Testament. That's clear, all right? So it would go to the Jew first and then it would venture off into the nations, all for the purpose of gathering the elect before the coming, which was the end, all right? That's the whole purpose in a nutshell. And so in my opinion, as Rob pointed out, and he's going to be pumped. He's probably like wagging his tail right now because I'm giving him credit on this. But he did. He, he definitely kind of popped it in place. But the nice thing is about AIL, here's what's great. The view is based upon a proper understanding of the narrative, not a false one, not a self-insertion one. It's based on a proper contextual audience relevance type of approach to the scriptures. So when something like this comes up, and you have a, a slight error that needs a little bit of correction, um, it pops right into place, like, like a shoulder going back into the socket. It's very easy, and it works great. And so, and it doesn't make you skip a beat, really. All it did was it said, all right, <laughs> this makes even more sense now. Because Jesus telling them in Matthew 10, can, remember now, he's talking to the original 12 here, and telling them what their purpose is. Obviously, if it was going to the Jew first, their purpose would be, to not go to any uh, Samaritan or Gentile city, but rather go to these ones first, right? Especially since we see that in that entire portion of Matthew chapter 10, okay, we see that Paul, uh, not Paul, but Jesus is actually talking about geographical Israel, right? The nation, Judea, right? A little later on in that same chapter, what does he tell him? He says, you shall not finish preaching through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. So the focus is geographically, and it makes perfect sense because the gospel was going to them first. All right, And then what you see happen as the story progresses and goes on, you have Paul being called off his high horse, right? He's given the revelation of Jesus. And what does God tell him? He says, you know, rise, blah, blah, blah. You will bear my name before kings, governors, or no, I'm sorry, kings, nations, and the children of Israel, right? Think about that. Everybody always says, oh, Paul was to the Gentiles, but there it is. You will bear my name before kings, Gentiles, and the children of Israel. Well, if Paul's main mission was to go out to the nations, and if it clearly says at the inception of that mission, when God gives him the revelation, <clears throat> if it says that his goal, or he was going to bear God's name before, meaning in front of, or to, kings, nations, and most importantly, and the children of Israel. And why is that? Well, because that's where the children of Israel were, right? I don't have to remind you about King Agrippa when Paul spoke before him, 
And what did he say to King Agrippa? God, we could go on and on down this rabbit trail, but it all fits so perfectly. What did Paul say to King Agrippa as he testified before him? He said, for the hope of the fathers, I stand here in trial, in chains. He said, for that hope, the resurrection hope, the 12 tribes served God earnestly day and night, hoping to attain it. So Paul actually tells the kings, right? The same kings of Acts 9 that God told Paul he would bear his name before. Obviously, this is fulfilling that. Go figure. But Paul is standing before King Agrippa in Acts 26, I believe it is. And he flat out tells him that the promise to the fathers of Israel, the 12 tribes, is what he's on trial for. That's what the whole thing was about. Right? So I trust you see how clear this is. Right? Paul gets summoned for the mission to go out and preach the name to the sons of Israel wherever, he, wherever they were. Then we see Paul preaching to those in Athens, going up to them and saying, we ought not be doing this because we are the offspring of God. They ought not worship idols because they had a higher responsibility. We see him writing to those in Galatia and Ephesus and Corinth, telling the ones in Corinth that, you know, they, they, had wor they were worshiping dumb idols, however they were led, right? It's all there, telling them that their fathers passed through the Red Sea and were baptized into Moses. Is your mind blown yet? Well, it should be because it's all there. All right, so Matthew 10, to me, seems more likely to be talking about the Jew first aspect of the gospel mission. He's summoning the 12 apostles, <clears throat> sending them out as sheep in the midst of wolves. And their mission was to preach through the towns of Israel. That was ultimately their mission. Then we see Paul get called to the scene. He has the revelation, the change of heart, and he starts conducting the same mission, but the Gentile, the nation aspect, not the Jew first, the Gentile, the nation aspect. And at the same time, in the very next chapter, we see Peter get the vision and is told to go to a man named Cornelius. And the Holy Spirit falls on Cornelius and they're all amazed that it marked him out too. <clears throat> okay. And what does Peter say? He says, uh, he literally says that the word which God sent to the children of Israel, this word you now know, he tells Cornelius, because Cornelius was one of the children of Israel. I know, I know it doesn't, it, it sounds perfect, right? But you're like, how could that be? That seems impossible. But the story is like a Harry Potter. It's not concerned with what's possible or impossible. It's, it's meant to be taken in a supernatural fairy tale type of way. Okay, now whether it happened or not, that's up to you. But it's, it's ideal in the, very sense, <clears throat> in the very sense that everything that needs to happen, happens. The Holy Spirit marks out all the sheep wherever they were in whatever state of life they were living in. Revelation 7 is very clear that the Holy Spirit marked out the 12 tribes. Revelation 5 says that those same individuals were called out from every nation, tribe, tongue, and kindred with that marking of the Holy Spirit. There is no arguing this. And likewise, they're the only ones standing in heaven at the end singing a salvation song. So again, Peter and Paul come on the scene <clears throat> after the mission had went out to Israel, or at least begun going out to Israel. And I believe now that Matthew chapter 10 is Jesus basically saying, start here because we're going to the Jew first, okay? Eventually, what would happen is they would expand that through the workings of Paul and obviously Peter as well, and that message would go far and wide to the Israel afar off, as Peter called them in Acts chapter 2. Right? And so you have this ultimate ingathering of the sheep at the end before the coming of the shepherd. And like I said, folks, lest we forget, none of this changes anything with AIO. None of it changes who Paul's audience was. None of it deals with uh, who Paul's audience was or uh, it, it doesn't disprove that Paul's audience was actually the lost tribes of Israel at all, actually. Has no relation to it. Right? So... 
this is just something that needed a little bit of fine tuning and tweaking. And it's great that it happened because it puts the story even further in place. It's amazing. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, I took a little break from the 100 Reasons. We're going to come back to that. And we're also going to check this out. We're going to be releasing the uh, Richard Carrier response and refutation very, very soon. I'm about 75% of the way done with it. And I plan to uh, finish it up within the next couple of days. So chances are Saturday, maybe not Saturday, perhaps Saturday will be the release of it. Um, Or if I don't release it on Saturday, it'll definitely be released on Monday. So stay tuned for that, folks. It's going to be an absolute slaughter fest. Take care, everybody. Don't forget to give her a like a ruski. We'll catch you on the next one. Bye-bye now.